I'm Kirk Jowers and welcome to the March 19th episode of COVID-19 with Dr. Russell Osgathorpe, the Chief Medical Officer of doTERRA and a board certified pediatric infectious diseases specialist. Russ, you've been spending most of your time doing rounds at Primary Children's Hospital this week. Thank you for taking the time with us again this evening. My pleasure. As of yesterday, all 50 states in the U.S. have confirmed cases. And yesterday, confirmed cases in the U.S. spiked 40% in just 24 hours. A remarkable increase. Remarkable increase. And you're going to walk us through that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mixed news in Asia. Singapore reported its biggest single-day jump in cases. And South Korea, uh, which looked like it was flattening the curve, is now seeing a new spike in cases mm -hmm. and clusters, which is yeah. concerning. But China continues to report... Uh, a slowing of new cases with no new local infections for the first time since the pandemic began. Yep. Some of these ups and downs in cases might be due to um, artifact, meaning that there might be testing irregularities or problems within certain countries that are driving that number so that we don't actually see the perfect picture that we would expect if we were doing the perfect amount of testing. But with that being said, this is the best picture we have right now, so we got to look at it and figure right. it out. Um, let's look at the graphic as we do each day from the World Health Organization. There are now 207,855 confirmed cases, 8,648 deaths, yes. and 166 countries with cases. It's startling to me just in the time we've been doing this together how each of those have just been on an incredible uh, upward rise. Yeah, that is what we call a pandemic, and it is startling for all of us to see those numbers of deaths increase so sharply. It is, it's tempting, I think, to let numbers just be numbers and get numb to them. Right. But each one of those numbers is a person. And um, we need to all do our part. Uh, you're meeting, you're, you're helping, uh, treating patients, treating people each day uh, yep. up at Primary Children's Hospital. And that's very different than than the forest of, of these the terrible numbers. It's yeah. just, it's not statistics. They're not numbers, they're people. Well, going back to numbers, though, uh, mm -hmm. you had some very interesting insights if we look at this graph yeah. of can China. We, can we talk about that a little bit? I'd like to. So if we look at the China graph, uh, what you can see here is that they have successfully flattened their curve. Yeah, um, there's a plateau at the end of that. Yeah, yeah. it's remarkably flat. Uh, we're all kind of surprised at what we're seeing there, and I would say very hopeful Right. that we can all do the same thing. If what is happening with the statistics is what is actually happening on the ground in China, then there is, there is hope on the horizon right. if we can flatten the curve. The next curve I want to show you is Italy's curve. So Italy huh. has been in the news. You've seen how they have been struggling to care for the number of people requiring intensive care. And this is why. Yeah. They are in the acceleration phase still of their outbreak. They have not been successful at flattening the curve. And if you look today, they've had dramatic increases in the number of positives. They are not slowing down. Right. And so this, From 28,000 to over 35,000 in one day, right. 7,000 increase. Right. And, and we know from the China outbreak that we would estimate that for every case that is positive, there are five to 10 more that are not being tested. If, so, if the testing is, is fairly up to, to par, which is a whole other discussion. At but. this stage in the worldwide pandemic, I'm not sure that many places have testing capability that they would like. Certainly not Europe and the United States. Right. Okay, now, if we move over to the United States graph. Yes. The United States graph is remarkable. We saw a dramatic increase in cases in the United States in the last 24 hours. And that line on the United States graph is almost vertical. Um, well, it goes straight up the last two days. Yeah, it, we are clearly at the beginning of our uh, epidemic here in the United States. Mm. What we would say is if a 747 is rumbling down the uh, jetway, that it is just getting its nose and back wheels off the ground. That's where we're at in right. our outbreak. We are not anywhere near to the peak of our outbreak in the United States, not even close. Um, so if you compare Italy and the United States, what you can see is, is that we are about eight or so days in front of Italy's outbreak based on cases. 
That means that we have an opportunity right now, right now, to bend the curve. Italy doesn't have to be our future. No, it doesn't have to be. But okay. we all have to get engaged and do something different. Well, then I do want to uh, revisit social distancing. Um, <laughs> and, and I, I mean, want to. We've done that every time. I know. Uh, we have but, to, though. but your graphs have made me change my thought process and a couple of questions. And I, I actually want to read the start of a Washington Post story today. Okay. Um, the deadly coronavirus has been met with a bit of a shrug among some in the under 50 set in the United States. Even as public health officials repeatedly urged social distancing, the young and hip spilled out of bars on Bourbon Street in New Orleans. They gleefully hopped on flights, tweeting about the rock bottom airfares, and they gathered in packs on beaches. Their attitudes were based in part on early data from China, which suggested COVID-19 might seriously sicken or kill the elderly, but spare the young. Mm. And what we're finding out today in news reports from the CDC and out of Europe is that that is not the case. That many, almost half of, in some countries, almost half of ICU beds are being filled with people under 50. There are people in their 20s and 30s that are in ICUs with COVID-19. We have to bend the curve. Yeah. In the United States, these, I'll be honest, I am saddened and embarrassed by our response as a country. We're better than this. Yeah. We as a country have done hard things and we can do them right now. Now is the time for us to actually not dismiss or ignore social distancing as individuals. It is not enough for countries and governments and churches and businesses to close up and do their part. We as individuals need to do our part families, keeping kids home. Um, well, let, let's get specific here. Okay. Um, uh, well, you mentioned to me that you had canceled your spring break. I did as well. That, yep. Um, uh, I've got two teenage daughters and... Well, before we get on, can I just be clear <laughs> on that? Yeah. I think we should all cancel spring, spring break. The next seven to eight days are critical. I know if how we frustrated wanna... you got when you were looking at those Fort Lauderdale pictures with As me. an infectious disease doctor, I know what happens at spring break. <laughs> And it is dangerous what is occurring yeah. on Bourbon Street and on beaches in South Florida. We need to be better than this. We need to take care of ourselves and each other better. So we cancel our spring break. We, we stay home. We should. Uh, our that, teenage daughters, they don't have to go to school. We don't have to go to work. We're all doing our thing from home. Uh -huh. At night, what if fewer than 10 of these teenagers, 10 or less, get together um, to keep those social bonding going. Yeah, my daughters are the same. Um, uh, we've canceled those sorts of events at our home and uh, would recommend that everybody for the next week stop getting together. I know that it's hard. I've watched it in my own home. Yeah. Um, being together spreads the virus. That's how viruses spread. If we want to stop it, we need to stop getting together and at all levels. Not I should note it's, it's kind of startling in this studio. We used to have like 20 people, you know, running around doing things. We now have three of us. Yep, that's <laughs> you and I and, and Luke, the amazing uh, guy who can do the job of 20 apparently. But, um, and that's important. Yeah. We really need to make sure that we limit our contacts. And so just to put that into perspective, if we have 10 people getting together downstairs in somebody's basement to play games and have fun and they spend a couple hours and one of them is positive and they get infected because they share a meal they share food they share pizza and soda and all the things they normally do right as teenagers yeah those kids go home and their families have four or five people in them so 10 families to four or five infecting those four or five at home family transmission is extremely efficient we're learning in this right viral outbreak so now we've got just from that we're, we're at 400. Right. Now we, we take those 400 and they keep doing it. And now we're at 4,000. And then we're at 40,000. And then we're at 400,000. Right. Viral outbreaks are incredibly swift. The only way we stop them in a public health perspective is by staying home and not being with one another. My final question today uh, that's been prevalent in many of the, the comments we've received is, 
Should pregnant women take additional precautions and are they and, and their baby at an enhanced risk with COVID-19? Okay, so this is a really important question and I'll answer it by saying that we don't know the actual answer for COVID-19. So I have to answer the question by applying what we know about other coronaviruses that have circulated like SARS um, and the other coronaviruses that circulate every year, as well as influenza, which is a respiratory virus. Right. We know that those viruses are problematic for pregnant women and that they cause them more morbidity and mortality, meaning that they get sicker and die more frequently than the general population. And so pregnant women, I would recommend, should be extremely vigilant about keeping this virus out of their homes, limiting contacts and social distancing. That whole impassioned plea I made earlier right. applies even more so to pregnant women. They're a vulnerable population to these sorts of viruses. We need to protect them. Another example why we don't want the teenagers coming home from the great party at the Osgothorpe home and, right. and uh, going to see their sister who's pregnant the next exactly. day. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly why. Russ, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you tomorrow.